Now, from the makers of Cold Water Omo... In the interrogation room in a house deep in the country, Captain Noble paced back and forth. He glowered at the slouched figure of Willie Fair. Willie sat in the easy chair, his face impassive, his eyes open but expressionless. He hadn't spoken a word, not to the captain or to John Steed or to Emma Peel. Now, alone with the captain, he continued to be sunk in lethargy. There was a knock at the door. The captain stopped in his tracks. Hmm. That'll be food. The only time you'll open your mouth. As the captain made for the door, Willie's eyes flickered after him and fastened on the gun at the captain's belt. Slowly, silently, Willie rose to his feet and removed his tie. The captain opened the door, took in a tray of food. Thanks. The captain, hampered by the tray, had difficulty in closing and locking the door. Willie advanced and threw his tie round the captain's neck, drawing it tight. <laughs> the Avengers. and Emma Peel, The Avengers. So many women say, once an Omo user, always an Omo user. Because there's just no dirt that can stand up to the cleaning power of cold water Omo. It solves Mrs. Sutherland's washing problems for her. Very dirty oil or grease moth. Yes. If you use cold water Omo, there's no trouble at all. It comes out very, very easily indeed. There's no washing problem too difficult for cold water Omo. Over one million South African housewives have proved it. International fashion models like Annabella G care for their complexion with Lux Beauty Soap. Lux is so creamy, so very soft. It cares for my complexion. I wouldn't use anything else. Lux, a beauty treatment as you bathe. this story in which John Steed and Emma Peel find their investigations lead to a dancing school where students could be taught, among other things, the quick, quick, slow death. Willie Fair had been a top agent. John Steed had worked with him in Berlin and got to appreciate the man's thoroughness. But everyone grows old and time makes even the most expert lose their touch. Willie had been downgraded, placed in a safer position, that of traffic officer. A man who looks after incoming spies or refugees seeking tranquility in Britain's peaceful countryside. But something had gone radically wrong. Willie had bungled a job, and a man called Peaver had died. Why, no one knew. Captain Noble couldn't get any information from Willie, who appeared to be suffering from severe shock. He was remote, unalive until he sprang at the captain and tried to choke the life out of him. You... You... will die. No. No. The captain reached for the gun at his belt, withdrew it from its holster. The struggle continued. Captain Noble got a grip on the gun and turned it into Willie's mouth. Willie jerked back under the impact of the bullet, but tenaciously held onto the tie, pulling it tighter and tighter around the captain's neck. The captain passed out. Willie, holding his wounded side, staggered to the telephone. Hello? Hello? Fear? Willie Fear? Listen. Had a road accident. They found Peaver. Yes. Yes, yes. All identification removed, but... Mm, we overlooked the evening suit. It was... Uh, it was hired from Lichen and Company. And... And... Uh, 
Willie fell to the floor, and the telephone receiver swung silently to and fro. There was a click from the phone, and then silence. Litchin and Company is one of the most respectable shops in London. Discreet, quiet, and fully carpeted. One feels upon entering the shop that hiring any form of wearing apparel is the right thing to do. Nothing underhand or poverty-stricken about Litchin and Co. Owning clothes becomes rather ordinary. Hiring them from Litchin's makes one feel like royalty. Steed entered, looked around the many curtain-changing booths, and eventually found Huggins, the manager. He showed him Peaver's suit of tails. Huggins held it up. Yes, this is definitely one of our suits. I recognize the cut, but... Oh, but dear me, his decorations must have been worn very clumsy. His holes. We'll never get those invisibly mended. The uh, horror can't exactly be mended either. I beg your pardon? Uh, do you remember who he was? Oh, quite definitely. I fitted him myself, actually. Long in the arm and short in the leg. Unusual combination. Uh, who was he? Sir? The man who hired the suit. Who was he? Don't you know? After all, you're returning the suit. And with all these holes in it, I'm afraid you'll have to forfeit the deposit. Uh, the deposit is yours. I made it all quite clear to Mr. Peaver. If there's any damage, I said, then you'll have to Peaver. forfeit... Yeah. You have his address. It'll be in my book, but that kind of information, sir, is strictly confidential. Uh, but not between business associates, surely. Business? Um, I'm from Baggy Pants. Look. Baggy Pants? Top secret work, diplomatic corps only. You've seen the pictures of visiting Russian diplomats, haven't you? Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Well, where do you think they get those terrible clothes from? Baggy Pants? Baggy pants. Guaranteed to destroy anyone's image in one zip. <clears throat> I'll get Peaver's dress for you. Huggins moved off towards his office beyond the changing booths. Spider, another assistant, swanned his way over to Steed and offered to show him a selection of hats. Steed, with nothing better to do, took off his bowler and tried on an admiral's hat. Oh, very smart. Mm, but... Gilbert and Sullivan, don't you mean? Huggins was returning with a ledger under one arm when the curtains of a nearby cubicle parted. Ivor Bracewell, who was trying on an evening suit, said, Excuse me, could you help me with this tie? Uh, oh, but of course, of course. Sir. Huggins moved into the changing booth. I never could manage to tie one of these things. In fact, I've often thought of getting myself one of those made out. Oh, my goodness, sir, no. No, that would never do. Not at all. The mark of a real gentleman is that he actually ties his tie. Now, if you'll kindly look into the mirror mm -hmm. and allow me to look over your shoulder, sir. That's it. Huggins moved behind the man, who quietly slipped a hand into the cummerbund at his waist and withdrew a deadly-looking knife. Huggins was still speaking when... Yes, it's a fact, sir, but in some places they won't allow you in unless you... Steed hung about for some minutes and went to look for Huggins. In doing so, he nearly collided with Bracewell, who was leaving the shop. No, <laughs> so sorry. My fault. Steed entered the changing booth. Huggins lay on the floor, a knife in his chest. Lying across the body was the ledger. Steed picked it up. All the pages had been ripped out. Not getting anywhere very fast, are you, Steve? <laughs> Naturally, confusion reigned in Litchin and Co. The staff were appalled. But not just because of Mr. Huggins' popularity, but because such a thing had happened within the shop itself. Such a terrible thing. At Litchin's of all places. We dressed the entire nation, you know. Oh, quite. Why, without us, Ascot Race Week would look like a nudist convention. Yes, I, I appreciate that, but, um, Cider, to get back to the crime, uh, this ledger, one of the missing pages, was this your only book of records? Yes, yes, I'm afraid so. And this was the suit you were discussing with Mr. Huggins before the, the unfortunate occurrence. That's right. I've been through all the pockets. Even the hidden ones? Hidden ones? Oh, yes. We always provide hidden pockets. It's part of the service, you see. Now, in this case, um, 
Strider fiddled with the waistband of the trousers and withdrew a pink slip. Ah, what have we here? Hmm, shoe repair ticket. Piedis. No ordinary shoe repair, my dear sir. Piedis is a shoe outfit as worthy of one of our suits. Everything is handmade. It must be the smartest shoe shop in town. Gentlemen and ladies always go to Piedis. Hmm. In which case, this looks like a job for Mrs. Peel. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so, Mrs. Peel was asked to call at Piedis. She did. And Piedi himself attended to her. He was positively entranced by Mrs. Peel's feet. He insisted on inspecting them. Oh, so slender, so pale, and so exquisitely elegant. Dear poor Madame Lessing, the saw. They're all so terribly useful for walking. Uh, you make the mock. But it is true what I say. Such expressive feet. They talk to me. Mrs. Peel couldn't resist wiggling her toes in reply. I shall make for you the most wonderful shoes. I shall compose a shoe. Uh, I shall encase these feet in the softest leather. Finely tooled. Superbly sewn. Devastatingly designed. Never fear. I shall treat them with delicate care. I'm so pleased. Of course, there is no measurement. Piedi never measures. He molds. I shall make the plaster cast, and from that I shall mold your shoes. One pair only. Well, that'll do to be going on with. Walking shoes, please. No slippers for the boudoir. Wellington boots in the kinkiest way. Oh, I don't think so. Oh, I'd like to collect these. These shoes were being repaired. Here's the ticket. Mrs. Beale handed over the repair ticket Steed had given her. A repair? For Mr. Peaver. You do remember Mr. Peaver, don't you? Two cones and a bunion. Regrettable. It saddens me to admit it, Mrs. Peel, but his shoes were not specially fitted. They weren't? Even the most skilled craftsman must lower his standards on some occasions. This was one of those things. It, it was, I blush to confess, a job lot that we delivered to all the different sizes. A job lot for whom? A team of dancers, ballroom dancers. You know, men in tails, women in tulle and sequins, and all of them positively thrashing their poor arches to destruction, doing irreparable damage to their extremities. This team of dancers, where do they come from? A Terpsichorean training techniques. It's a, a dance school. Yeah, actually, I'm uh, told they're looking for dance instructresses. Oh? Dance instructresses? How oh, very interesting. Mrs. Peel, uh, you would not uh, be considering... Uh, oh, no, not with your lovely arches. It would be criminal. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Peely. I shan't become a fallen woman, and I shall never have fallen arches. I wouldn't bet on either of those facts, Mrs. Peel. Out of the blue comes a new way to fight tooth decay for Keeps. New fluoride for Keeps toothpaste. It's the clear blue way to fight tooth decay, and it's the best anti-decay toothpaste around. New great tasting for Keeps toothpaste. The clear blue way to fight tooth decay. Family fluoride for Keeps toothpaste. The cleaning power of cold water Omo gives you the superb cleanness you want from a washing powder. Listen to Mrs. Baxter of Claremont. It really is good. I mean, it, it's unbelievable, really, that, that it could be so good, you know. Once an Omo user, always an Omo user. The Avengers. every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers, brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omo. Cold Water Omo.